Well, welcome to Honor 2750. Uh, we're now moving into a new module. We're focusing in on water quality and availability. And I want to spend the next two class periods actually giving you the science behind uh, what you need to understand to be able to talk about uh, relevant and current issues with regards to both water quality and availability. Let's just start off with uh, water itself. I mean, water is uh, obviously in a very important uh, molecule for life. Uh, it has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and it's slightly polar in that it has a, a charge distribution across the molecule itself, which is uh, not equal. Uh, one end is slightly positive and one end is slightly negative, and that has some implications for the properties of water. So one of those properties is the hydrogen bonding that results from that polarity. And that uh, hydrogen bonding results in a high surface tension. Uh, it also makes water a universal solvent. And it also results in a high heat capacity, which means that it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water relative to other substances. Uh, so. Um, if you put a lot of heat into water, uh, it won't necessarily change temperature uh, rapidly, and that helps to moderate our climate change. So, obviously, water is extremely important. It's important to all living things. It composes the majority of our own body. It's the habitat for lots of organisms, and we can only survive a few days without water. And as mentioned before, the high heat capacity of water helps regulate our climate and, and uh, keep it from doing wild, uh, wild extremes. And uh, you already know that uh, cities that uh, are located near oceans have uh, much uh, smaller temperature differences between summer and winter than uh, locations that are further inland. So water is also important as an erosion tool it uh, sculpts many of the surfaces on this on the planet and it's also important because it dilutes and degrades waste products however it is possible to have too much of a good thing uh, just uh, think about what's going on in hawaii right now they're having torrential rains they're having the worst flooding that they've had in the last you know 25 to 50 years uh, and uh, it can lead to uh, rivers overflowing their banks, uh, flooding the floodplains, and doing lots of structural damage. So that's one way that water can be a problem. You can also have too little water. And uh, California has been plagued by significant drought uh, over much of the, uh, the last decade. And that has huge implications on not only our ability to uh, live off the land, in terms of food production, but it also has implications on air quality uh, because uh, arid conditions can lead to increased chances of wildfires and it can also lead to blowing dust and both of which degrade the air quality downwind of the arid regions. And lastly, so you can have too much water, you can have too little water, or you can have lots of water, but it can be poor quality and not suitable for your purposes. And that usually comes about through uh, the pollution which is put into the water from a variety of sources. It can come from point sources which are like a discharge uh, sewer or a pipe that puts things directly into the water or it can come from an area source where you have runoff that uh, comes from a large area like a field or a parking lot something like that and that gets in then to the water supply. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it uh, comes from point sources or from area sources, the effect is still the same. It degrades the overall water quality and can impede its use uh, for humans uh, for consumption or even for agriculture, depending on the toxics that are put in the water. So one of the things that uh, people have tried to do to um, increase the availability of food production in arid and semi-arid lands is to irrigate. That is, they pump water from a different location and they use it to turn areas into productive agricultural areas. Uh, 
It's the greatest use of water, of fresh water on our planet, using 71% of all of the fresh water on our planet. And uh, if you fly over the Midwestern United States and you see these uh, crop circles, not the kind uh, made supposedly by aliens, but uh, these are the kinds that are made by irrigation. The irrigation system itself uh, spins around a central axis and uh, every place that is hit by the water can then grow a crop. And that's why you see these uh, large uh, uh, crop circle areas uh, in areas where it's irrigated. So what is the source of that water? Well, for most of these, it's tapping into groundwater, uh, which is water that exists below the surface. So, unfortunately, although we have to lots and lots of water on our planet, 97% of the Earth's water is salty. Uh, and so that means that 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water, which means that we can use it. However, of that 3%, only 0.014% of the planet's water is actually accessible as uh, fresh water. So, for example, you know, oceans and saline lakes make up, you know, 97.4% of water. Fresh water is 2.6%. And of that 2.6% of fresh water, almost 2% of that is locked up in ice caps and glaciers. And uh, almost all of the rest of it is locked up as groundwater. And there's only, like I said, 0.014% that is surface waters. And that is uh, between about 50% of that is contained in lakes. Uh, you know, a smaller fraction is in uh, soil moisture. Some of it's in the atmosphere, some of it's in rivers, and some of it's in plants. And one of the scary things is that uh, even though you know, we have this fresh water that is available, it's not distributed evenly across the globe. And by 2025, it's estimated that one third of the human population will live in areas that lack uh, easy access to fresh water. So the hydrologic cycle is something that you've obviously learned uh, starting in elementary school and working its way up. Uh, so it begins, of course, with the evaporation. Uh, typically speaking, we refer to this as evaporation from uh, oceans, surface waters, uh, evapotranspiration from uh, plant materials. And, you know, it doesn't require the oceans to be boiling in order to evaporate. Obviously, that's a good thing. Um, they will uh, evaporate uh, as long as the uh, air above the ocean is not completely saturated. So you have this evaporation which puts water vapor into the atmosphere. It uh, is moved around by the winds and if it's lifted then it can cool and eventually condense and if enough of it condenses it can fall down as precipitation. And that precipitation uh, has several pathways uh, once it reaches the ground. Uh, one of those pathways is runoff. Uh, it just basically um, doesn't have time to sink into the soil because the soil is either imp impermeable or it is uh, saturated. And that will lead to runoff, which will eventually go into streams and will go into lakes. That's probably the one that we're most familiar with. However, the precipitation <coughs> that doesn't uh, run off uh, can infiltrate into the soil, raising the soil moisture and can eventually percolate down into unconfined aquifers, which are groundwater that is readily available. And then there are some places where the water can be input into um, a source region for a confined aquifer, which is essentially a uh, aquifer that has a solid cap of rock on top over much of it. And uh, that uh, recharge rate is thought to be rather slow for the confined aquifers because the source areas, uh, the recharge areas, are thought to be uh, fairly rare. So let's take a look at global freshwater availability when we look at cubic meters per person per year. So if you look at uh, continents that are uh, water abundant, uh, essentially, that is uh, South America and much of North America. And this is uh, water per person per year. So if you look at Australia, uh, 
You wouldn't think of Australia as having great amount of freshwater availability. However, the population of Australia is less than the population of California. So what little water they do have um, is able to support them. Uh, there are parts of Africa, uh, specifically the equatorial region, uh, that uh, does have lots of water, but there are other parts of Africa that are definitely uh, arid and do not have a significant amount of water per person. And that is also true uh, as you move over to uh, India and into China as well, where the number of people is very large, even though the water supply is large. So there are different types of water scarcity. There's physical water scarcity uh, and there's economic water scarcity. Uh, the difference is, is that physical water just means that it's not there to be had. Uh, and you can see that the physical water scarcity, which is shown in this one in kind of the orangish color, is the deserts of the world, the dry lands. Uh, and that extends basically in the southwestern U.S., uh, parts of uh, Brazil and much of uh, the northern part of Africa, as well as the Middle East and the desert regions of China, including the Gobi and the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, there's also part of uh, Australia, which is considered a water desert with physical water scarcity. But then there's also economic water scarcity where you don't have the infrastructure to be able to deliver that water uh, efficiently to the people. And if you can't deliver it, it doesn't matter how much you have, the people still suffer. Uh, and so where is that the biggest problem? Well, it's a big problem in much of Africa. Um, some parts of uh, South America and a couple of parts of Asia, including Bangladesh and uh, parts of India. So let's compare uh, the amount of water resources on a continental scale. So if we look at the percent of the water's resources in blue, you'll see that uh, Asia has 36% of the freshwater resources and South America has 26%. Uh, North America, ironically, has about 15%. And then you start looking at the, comparing that to the percent of the world's population, where Asia only has 36% of the water, it has uh, over 60% of the world's population. And that puts pressures on the available water. Unlike North America, where we have a much smaller population, uh, roughly 7% of the world's population relative to our water abundance of 15%. Uh, so this just basically reinforces the previous uh, uh, plot, basically, uh, which was showing the amount of water that's available per person. So global water use. So what are we using this fresh water for? Well, by far, the, the largest use of water, of fresh water, is for agricultural purposes to grow food. And as the population grows, the need for food increases as well, which means that the need for water increases as well. Um, municipal use, which is basically cities, uh, is an 11%, and industrial uses for businesses uh, make up an additional 19%. So if we look at the water use in the United States, it's a little bit different uh, than the rest of the world. Uh, we roughly use 38% uh, of our uh, water for agriculture and for uh, cooling purposes for electrical electricity generation. Uh, so we're using a much smaller fraction of our available water for agriculture. And public and industry, we use a little bit less water uh, than the global average for industry. 11% um, versus 19%, and our municipal use is about the same. So here we have the amount of water consumed per person per year to show differences across the world. Uh, so for example, let's take a look at the United States. So uh, in the United States, uh, we typically use between 2,100 and 2,500 cubic meters of water per year per person which makes us one of the higher water users in the world. And you can contrast that uh, with uh, much of Africa, uh, where the use is uh, between uh, 600 and 1,000 cubic meters per year. Uh, 
Now, it's interesting to see that the water usage across Africa, even in the equatorial region where there is plenty of water available, is rather low, uh, in part because they don't have the infrastructure to deliver the, deliver the water, and that is the economic scarcity that we were talking about before. But you can see there are wide variations. Uh, the amount of water used per person in China and India is much less than in North America. Let's take a look at water consumption per capita in cubic meters per person per year. Uh, and the percentages here show the portion of the total water consumption used for agricultural purposes. So let's start off and take a look at the United States. So the United States on average in this, this data is basically showing uh, a use of about 1,700 uh, cubic meters per year for the United States, and about 40% of our fresh water is used for agricultural purposes. You can contrast that with Iraq, where they use almost 2,000 cubic meters of water per person, and 80% of that water is used for agricultural purposes. And the outlier here is Turkmenistan, where they use more than 5,000 cubic meters of water per person, and they use 94% of that for agriculture. And what they have actually done is uh, Turkmenistan is actually a pretty dry area. And for whatever reason, they decided to grow cotton in the desert. And it requires an incredible amount of water. And what they did is they diverted water that was moving into the Aral Sea, which was a very large freshwater lake, to grow cotton. And the environmental result of that was that the Aral Sea dried up in the span of about uh, 20 years. Uh, and it's been an environmental catastrophe since. The fisheries uh, basically collapsed. Uh, the air quality got much worse. Uh, it got much hotter because the water was no longer moderating the temperatures and they're still trying to figure out what to do, um, whether or not uh, they can put the water back into the lake or not. But you'll see that uh, you know, the arid regions use a much higher fraction of the uh, water for agriculture. So let's talk a little bit about these primary water sources. Uh, for the surface runoff, about two-thirds of the water that is runoff is lost to floods. Uh, it quickly moves through the system and back out to the oceans. And about one-third of the surface runoff is actually available for human root use. Uh, we also have groundwater as a potential source of water. And uh, groundwater, uh, we have several definitions here. We have the zone of saturation which is the uh, area of the uh, soil that contains the water itself. Uh, the water table is the top of the zone of saturation. So the zone of saturation is basically where the soil is holding as much water as it possibly can. And the water table is defined as the top of that zone. So if you have more water that goes into the aquifer, the water table will rise because the saturated layer is deeper. And if you have a drought situation, the top of the saturation zone will uh, sink, and so the water table will decrease. The aquifer is defined as these water-saturated layers of sand or gravel where groundwater can actually flow. So an aquifer is a permeable rock where water can actually move through the, the bed. Uh, and so if you dig a well and you start pulling water out, uh, water will move through their permeable rock and will replace the water which you withdrew. Um, the groundwater recharge is rather slow, and the speed at which it uh, is recharged uh, depends upon whether or not it is an unconfined or a confined aquifer, and also depends upon the uh, amount of rainfall, the amount of runoff, uh, and the type of soil uh, as well. So surface water, uh, you can think of this easily as your streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, reservoirs, and wetlands. Uh, it uh, is replenished uh, by runoff, and we define a watershed as an area of land that's drained by a single river. And so if we think about what watershed you know, we live in, you know, 
uh, depending on where you live along the Wasatch Front, you could be, uh, you know, living in the, the Jordan River watershed or the Weber River watershed or the Bear River watershed. Those are the three biggest rivers. Um, and then, of course, the watershed gets smaller and smaller as you move up into the mountains. Uh, and you have smaller watersheds that can contribute to a larger river downstream. Of course, if you take these watersheds to the largest scale, you can get to continental scale watersheds. And here we have uh, essentially watersheds that drain into the Atlantic Ocean, which would primarily uh, be through the middle part of the United States, everything that's drained by the Mississippi and Missouri and Ohio rivers. Uh, and the eastern part, there are smaller rivers that also drain into the Atlantic. Uh, in the Pacific side, on, on the west of the uh, continental divide, you have rivers that all go into the Pacific Ocean. And then up north, uh, there is a different continental divide where all the rivers will lead to the Arctic Ocean. And then you'll notice here in the western United States, there's a thing called the Great Basin. And the Great Basin is an area where none of the rivers actually flow to the ocean. And all you have in that area is terminal basin lakes. Uh, so the water goes into the Great Salt Lake, but there's no outlet for the Great Salt Lake. So the Great Salt Lake is a terminal basin lake. And the Intermountain West here, this Great Basin, is full of lots of these residual playas, uh, these residual uh, lakes, uh, terminal basin lakes that are either still wet or have dried up. So here we have the basin that is uh, drained by the Colorado River. The Colorado River is the biggest river in the western part of the United States, at least the southwestern part. We have the Columbia and the northwestern part. Um, it, uh, the headwaters for the Colorado River begin in Colorado but it drains parts of Wyoming, about half of Utah, a little bit of New Mexico, and all, basically all of Arizona, and a little bit of Nevada. All of those are contributing to the Colorado River. Unfortunately, this is an area where climate change is impacting the uh, amount of water that's available in this watershed, and uh, data has shown that the availability of water is decreasing at a rate of about 10% per decade right now due to climate change. And there are literally uh, millions and tens of millions of people that rely upon water from the Colorado River uh, for their uh, existence in the United States. Uh, here we have the uh, tributaries that uh, feed into the Mississippi River. Uh, we have the Missouri River, which is the largest tributary uh, we have the Upper Mississippi, we have the Ohio River Basin. And then, uh, I love this, uh, if you are from Kansas, you'll refer to the uh, Arkansas River Basin. If you're from the state of Arkansas, they look at people from Kansas and go, why the heck are you mi purposely mispronouncing the word? It's Arkansas, you crazy people. Uh, and then in Northern Texas, we have the Red River Basin uh, as well. And then in Tennessee, you have the Tennessee River Basin. And all of those contribute, eventually flow to the Mississippi. Uh, up north, in the northwest, we have the Columbia River watershed. Uh, it drains almost all of Idaho, uh, part of Nevada, part of Montana, part of Alberta and British Columbia, and much of Washington and Oregon. Uh, the Columbia River uh, has its headwaters uh, up in uh, essentially uh, kind of Alberta and it eventually reverses course, comes back down into the United States, and then is fed through several rivers. The largest river that feeds into it in the United States is the Snake River, which basically drains all of the southern half of Idaho. So too much water can result in floods. Uh, too much water is a natural phenomenon. We have uh, had floods. Uh, ever since uh, people have been around, regardless of whatever they do to the uh, uh, ground, uh, floods are just a, a something we have to deal with that's natural. Uh, however, there are things that humans can do to the landscape that can exacerbate the flooding by limiting the ability of the water to sink into the ground.
ground and recharge the groundwater. So some of the things that humans can do to aggregate flooding is draining wetlands. Uh, wetlands are an area which slows down the water flow and is usually a water recharge area. And if you eliminate the wetlands, uh, you will accelerate the flow of the water across that region, and you will also decrease the amount of water that can go into the groundwater through that area. Uh, if we remove vegetation, uh, it can increase the speed of flow of runoff, which also reduces the amount of water infiltration. Uh, and if you think about what happens in burned areas, like in uh, California when they have burned vegetation, uh, and then you have rains that come after that, they often result in significant amounts of runoff and landslides uh, because the water is moving so fast across the surface. Uh, other things that people can do to exacerbate floods uh, are constricting the flow of the water uh, by creating levees. Uh, basically, if you look at the bottom left, um, you have a natural river that is allowed to meander uh, and it changes course over time. And anywhere on that floodplain is an area where that river can uh, move to. And it's an area that uh, during times of high water uh, are likely to be inundated with water. However, in the middle, if we want to constrain the flow of the river by building levees, then we actually reduce the uh, overall volume that can exist in the water. And if we do have a flood situation, um, it can be bad because you can basically have a breach in the levee, and then you can have constructed areas that uh, are being flooded through that breach in the levee. And of course, living on floodplains is always a risk uh, because uh, you are in an area where the river naturally wants to flood over time. And we have created these artificial structures known as levees, which help protect the uh, structures that have been built on the floodplains, but they don't always uh, function correctly. So changes in surface runoff. Well, prior to 1970, about 10% of stormwater became runoff. However, now in the United States, about 55% of stormwater is transported as runoff uh, because development is significantly reduced the amount of uh, land where the water can actually infiltrate. So if you imagine the amount of concrete uh, and asphalt here in Salt Lake City versus what was here you know, 50 years ago, uh, there's a lot more uh, construction, there's a lot more infrastructure, there's a lot more parking lots, there's a lot more structures, and all of that has reduced the uh, available land for infiltration. So as a result, uh, the uh, rain, when it falls, is more likely to end up as stormwater and runoff uh, as opposed to infiltration into the groundwater. So stormwater runoff uh, has some potential problems. It's the uh, largest contributor of non-point or area source pollution because the stormwater runoff can contain nutrients. Uh, and what do we mean by nutrients? Uh, we mainly mean fertilizers, uh, so nitrogen and phosphorus that are put on people's lawns or on golf courses or used in agricultural areas. <clears throat> when you uh, have the runoff, it takes that and nutrients and puts them into the streams and to the lakes. Um, you can also have metals, uh, these sometimes heavy metals, uh, that can be transported. You have suspended solids, uh, that could be uh, dirt, it could be manure, uh, it could be all sorts of things that are moved about when the water actually starts to move. Uh, we also put a lot of pesticides on our crops, and the pesticides end up in the water uh, due to runoff. And then we also have hydrocarbons. So this is oil and gas that is spilled, uh, that leaks, those sorts of things that end up in the water supply. And then you can also have microorganisms which come from nature, but they can also come from the excrement of animals along the way. And if you are familiar with the restrictions on dogs in the big and little Cottonwood Canyons, um, part of that is to try and limit the amount of microorganisms that get into the water supply since we use the water from the big and little cottonwood canyons for our consumption here in the Salt Lake Valley. 
And just lastly, nutrients, metals, and suspended solids are always uh, in storm water. And sometimes you have pesticides, sometimes you have hydrocarbons, and sometimes you have microorganisms. So deforestation, <clears throat> as I alluded to before, deforestation uh, can have a big impact on flooding and landslides. So on the left, we have a healthy forest on a slope, uh, and you have part of your hydrologic cycle. You've got your evapotranspiration. You have a diverse uh, habitat. Uh, you've got a river at the bottom, and these trees are serving to hold the soil in place, which reduces the soil erosion. <coughs> And the uh, leaf litter at the bottom uh, improves the fertility of the soil and uh, helps uh, slow down the water as it moves across the surface, allowing more infiltration. So on the right, we have deforested the land. So we have decreased the amount of evapotranspiration. We have uh, now have a situation where when rain falls, it starts to quickly move across the surface and gain speed as it goes down the slope, which leads to erosion uh, and potential landslides uh, becoming destabilized. And then you end up with all of that silt and sediment that ends up in the river below, which can seriously impact the quality of the water uh, in the river below this deforested area. So too much water. Uh, we can have heavy rainfall, obviously. That's what's going on in Hawaii right now. You could have a very rapid snowmelt. Uh, so even if you don't have a huge snowpack, you can get significant flooding from it, depending on how quickly it melts. Uh, the, this is basically happens occasionally here in Utah, where we have a very cool spring, which uh, allows the snow to persist uh, into the hotter months of the summer. And then all of a sudden you get a hot spell of 100 degree temperatures down here and it rapidly melts the snow, uh, which can result in a significant uh, in, uh, inflow into the rivers, which can inundate the system and lead to flooding. And then, of course, if we remove our vegetation or just uh, destroy our wetlands, uh, then all of that can lead to, to flooding. Uh, the floodplains obviously have advantages for farmers. Uh, they tend to be very fertile areas, and so farmers like to be able to plant crops in wetlands, but however, they are run the risk of being completely flooded and having their crops uh, completely destroyed. <coughs> These floodplains are really dependent upon the levees uh, in order to maintain them as a dry area that can be used for either residences or agriculture. And the floodplains uh, are also a ground recharge, uh, groundwater recharge area. But if you put levees in, then the amount of groundwater recharge has been reduced. So here we have a dam and a reservoir, and the dam can serve several purposes. Uh, one, it can be used to generate uh, hydropower. Two, it provides flood control. Uh, three, it provides uh, a reservoir for recreation and fixing, fishing, and four, it can basically control the flow so that it provides water year round. So that's water storage. But the dam and reservoir can also create issues. First, uh, it uh, increases the loss of water through evaporation because of the larger surface area. It also floods areas that were previously part of the floodplain. Um, so it makes them off limits for uh, agriculture or for dwellings along those lines. Uh, and uh, it can also collect silt and not prevent and prevents that from moving downstream. So downstream, uh, you're really deprived of that nutrient rich silt and the floodplain becomes less and less uh, fertile over time. And lastly, uh, if you have salmon or some spawning fish that can be completely disrupted by the uh, the obstacle uh, of the dam that prevents them from moving upstream easily. So if we look at groundwater, uh, it's really, we're talking about all the water that's found under the earth's surface and it's refreshed or recharged uh, through infiltration into the ground. And it's stored in these underground aquifers uh, 
And <clears throat> the remember that there is an unconfined aquifer, which is uh, on top of an impermeable surface. And then we have a confined aquifer, uh, which is underneath a layer of impermeable rock. And when you put water into uh, an unconfined aquifer, uh, it can eventually leak out and it can actually uh, be discharged into rivers, into lakes, or can come out uh, in springs. So these aquifers themselves are composed of porous layers of sand, gravel, or rock, basically permeable rock, uh, lying below the water table. Uh, so the water table is higher than these, and you have migration of water through the rock. So here we have uh, the two types of aquifers. We have the unconfined aquifer, and if you dig a well into the unconfined aquifer, you need to have a pump in order to bring the water up. Uh, as you pump that water up, the uh, water table will go down. And eventually, if you pump too much faster than the infiltration or recharge rate, uh, then the well will go dry. There's another type of well which goes deeper and goes through the impermeable rock layer into the confined aquifer. And that type of aquifer is under an immense amount of pressure and it will actually, uh, the water will actually flow to the surface. And that's what we refer to as an artesian well. Um, it's a free flowing uh, water well and it's tapping into older uh, water that has recharged at a much lower rate over a much longer period of time. If you remove uh, water uh, beyond the recharge rate, uh, the confined aquifer actually gets more shallow uh, and permanently decreases uh, its uh, ability to hold water. So how does infiltration actually occur? Well, you need to have percolation of that water through the soil and cracks uh, into a permeable uh, layer. And the longer the water sits on the surface, the more time that it has to percolate down. And so the upper zone uh, of the soil layers that hold both air and water is known as the zone of aeration. And the lower zone where the soil layers, uh, all the spaces are filled with water, uh, that's known as the zone of saturation, and the water table, of course, is the top of that zone of saturation. And the water table will fluctuate throughout the year, and it will also fluctuate uh, from year to year uh, as you have wetter years and drier years. So here we have the known aquifers uh, in the United States. There are lots and lots of aquifers. The largest, by far the largest of these aquifers, is the Ol Ol yeah, Olagala Aquifer, uh, which is in Nebraska, Kansas, uh, Colorado, Oklahoma, and Texas. Light blue in this one. It's the largest uh, freshwater aquifer in the United States. It's being used to irrigate croplands in, in those western parts of those states. So there are a lot of advantages of using that groundwater. That groundwater is available year round. You don't have to worry about evaporation and it's uh, not very expensive because there is uh, essentially no charge for using the water. Uh, you drill your own well and you have access to the water. However, there are potential problems associated with tapping into that groundwater. One is lowering of the water table basically pulling out water faster than it's being recharged. And in the United States, we're currently withdrawing at four times the replacement rate, which means that uh, over time, the water available in groundwater resources is being depleted. And it's uh, basically, although it is a renewable resource, it's not renewable at the rate at which we're pulling it out. So it's not sustainable, the amount of water that we're using for agriculture. Uh, tapping into the groundwater. Uh, if you have that subsidence and the compaction uh, by pulling out the water too much, you can have a permanent reduction in the capacity of the aquifer. Uh, if you are near the ocean and you pump out the fresh water, you can have saltwater intrusion, which will permanently 
uh, destroy the water quality in that aquifer. Uh, we are in danger of having that situation here in Utah. Of course, the Great Salt Lake is a salt water body, and uh, Tooele is pumping out water at an unstable, unsustainable rate. And there is a plume of salt water that is moving from the Great Salt Lake towards the freshwater aquifer that Tooele is actually using. If that, if that uh, salt water gets to the well sites, then uh, they're going to have nothing but salt water, which will be a big problem. If you tap into the groundwater, you can reduce the stream flows or dry up springs. Uh, that's happened here in Utah on the northern part of the Great Salt Lake. There's a place called Locomotive Springs, and it used to have uh, millions of gallons of water per day coming out of it, of fresh water. And uh, it was a uh, wetland area with millions of birds. And the farmers in the area tapped into the groundwater, pumped out too much groundwater to grow alfalfa, and dried up the springs. And now the area is not really a wetland, and all of those millions of birds are gone. Uh, there are other problems of tapping into the groundwater. Anytime you puncture uh, into the ground and drill with a well, uh, there's a potential for contamination. And if you contaminate water inside an aquifer, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do any mitigation or cleaning it up. So here we have uh, areas where you can see in blue where the amount of water that we're pulling from the aquifer is not sustainable, and we're doing it at a very high rate. Uh, the yellow areas are areas where we're pumping out water that's still faster than the recharge rate, but not nearly as bad. And the other color, the, the light yellow, um, are areas where uh, the overdrafts are essentially nil, and we are using the groundwater in a sustainable manner. So here we have the Ogallala Aquifer. And it is, uh, like I said, the largest uh, freshwater aquifer in uh, North America, extending all the way from Nebraska to Texas. And the water level change in terms of water table uh, has been uh, decreasing uh, significantly uh, due to uh, the overdrafts of water. And so you can see that much of Nebraska is, uh, has an insignificant change in the water level between 1980 and 1995 over a 15 year period. And uh, that is an area where you're not having an overdraft, but much of Western Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, and Texas are in an overdraft capacity. And in some of these areas, uh, they have uh, in, uh, decreased uh, the, the water table declines uh, have gone down quite a bit uh, during those same time periods. So if we look at the groundwater removal rate as a percentage of the annual recharge, so this is looking at overdrafts essentially in a worldwide perspective. You can see that uh, much of the northern African region and the Middle East is currently in an overdraft situation where they're pulling out more uh, water than uh, is uh, sustainable. And this is uh, based on a country level. So if you look at the United States as a country, we're not doing an overdraft on the groundwater, but on a regional basis, we are. So depleting the aquifer really just means that you're removing the groundwater faster than it can be replenished. Uh, it lowers the water table, it can result in land subsidence, and can result in saltwater intrusion. And that is currently a problem in Florida. The, one of the things that we do as scientists is we try and figure out how old the water is that we're actually pulling out of the ground. Uh, and uh, there are certain parts of Utah where the groundwater is more than 10,000 years old, which means that the water was put there uh, basically at the end of the last ice age uh, and is essentially a non-renewable resource that we tap into. Uh, there are other places where the uh, recharge rate is much higher, uh, such so uh, that happens along here along the Wasatch Front. We have some geography that allows some quick replenishing of the aquifer underneath Salt Lake City. Um, 
but uh, there's also a situation where you can tap into uh, aquifers that are underneath the ocean. Uh, if you think about uh, the ocean levels, they have uh, risen significantly since the last uh, ice age. And uh, during the last ice age, the continental shelves were actually exposed dry land. And during that time period, they developed uh, freshwater aquifers. And then when the sea level rose, it covered them up. And that freshwater aquifers are actually still underneath the continental shelves. Now that is clearly not a renewable resource because there's no way to recharge those aquifers with fresh water. If you remove the water uh, from those resources, it will be eventually replaced with salt water. But it is a resource that was recently discovered. So if you use surface waters too much and overdraw, uh, you can do severe damage to ecosystems. Uh, you have wetlands that dry up. An example of that is the Everglades. Uh, you can have estuaries that become too salty. And you can actually end up evaporating or uh, basically uh, depleting the surface waters such that lakes will be depleted. Or in the case of terminal basin lakes, they can actually um, be completely depleted uh, and turn into a dry lake bed. And worldwide, the demand for water is growing as the number of humans increases uh, and the expected consumption is expected to grow exponentially uh, as the population goes up. And that uh, leads to potential conflict over available resources, food, water, uh, energy, those sorts of things. So Polluting the groundwater is a really bad situation. So uh, there are several ways that that can be done. Uh, all of them essentially kind of involving human activity. So one way is essentially by uh, having runoff from industrial mining facilities. That runoff is uh, has toxic metals in it. And if you uh, allow that uh, runoff to move to the wetlands, it will then infiltrate into the aquifer and will contaminate the uh, unconfined aquifer. Uh, you can have uh, waste lagoons uh, that uh, are unlined uh, that uh, can put uh, materials into the unconfined aquifer that you don't want, uh, as can landfills. If you have landfills that are not lined uh, or the lining has degraded over time, um, as the material in the landfill degrades, some of that material can end up in the unconfined freshwater aquifer. We actually have that situation just west of the uh, airport. We have a very old landfill uh, from uh, 100 years ago, and it has created a plume of pollution uh, in the unconfined aquifer that is actually moving towards the Great Salt Lake right now. Uh, one of the most common ways to uh, pollute uh, groundwater is actually pesticide infiltration from uh, that's being applied to crops. And also uh, gasoline stations uh, are another source if you have leaking underground storage tanks that can put uh, hydrocarbons directly into the unconfined aquifer as well. And anytime that you dig a well, you risk the uh, ability or you risk uh, the provide a, a pathway by which uh, contaminants can enter into the system. In areas that don't have sewage systems, you have septic tanks and those septic tanks uh, can leak over time and infiltrate the unconfined aquifer. And so you're seeing here a mantra that uh, the unconfined aquifer is really at risk. The confined aquifer, however, is uh, generally much less uh, at risk from contamination. Uh, however, uh, one of the things that actually goes on is uh, there are things called hazardous waste injection wells, where they actually drill down through the unconfined aquifer, through the confined aquifer, and go down below the confined aquifer and uh, pump hazardous waste into the ground uh, below all of those aquifers. Now, theoretically, that shouldn't uh, pose any risk to either aquifer, uh, 
But if you have leakage from the casing of that uh, wells, then you can have infiltration of hazardous waste into both the unconfined and the confined aquifer. So what it comes down to is water management is crucial uh, if you want to have a sustainable supply of high quality water. So how do we supply water? Well, we store water by building dams. We can divert water for other purposes, uh, for irrigation purposes, and we can go through desalinization to actually create more fresh water. Right now, however, desalination is extremely expensive uh, to build and operate the plants uh, and requires a, a very large amount of energy. So if we have renewable energy that becomes cheap, uh, then desalinization actually becomes more uh, cost um, competitive and it might be something that we move forward to in coastal areas, um, especially arid coastal areas, uh, where there's a greater need for water. Uh, desalinization is one of the options moving forward. So water conservation is crucial because you know, every drop of water that you conserve is a drop of water that you don't have to store or uh, transport. And so the single largest water use worldwide is agriculture. And so if you want to make significant changes that impact our amount of water availability, you really need to look at how we use water in agriculture. And much of the water that we use in agriculture is wasted. Uh, we lose it to either evaporation or seepage. And one solution that can be used on certain types of farm is called drip irrigation, where you have perforated pipes to distribute the water. The water goes straight to the plants and it reduces water use by 40 to 60%. Now this isn't necessary in water rich areas, but in arid areas where you are, you know, say pumping groundwater to irrigate, reducing the water use by 40 to 60% could easily move you from a situation where you are clearly not sustainable in the rate at which you're removing the water um, to a place where you're much closer to sustainability. So there's also water conservation at home, uh, municipal water. Uh, one option that uh, people can use is to use gray water. So uh, water that uh, comes from the sinks and from the bathtub uh, is considered gray water. Uh, and uh, not from the toilet. Uh, uh, so, and you can use that gray water, you can reuse it. You can reuse it outside or you can reuse it in the toilet system uh, to uh, actually reduce your uh, demand for fresh water. And there are other sorts of things. We can have water saving fixtures and appliances. Uh, old, uh, there are high flow and low flow uh, toilets. There are high flow and low flow shower heads. Uh, there are different types of uh, water efficiencies associated with uh, dishwashers um, and uh, it can really save the amount of water that you can use uh, by uh, going with low flow devices whenever possible. Leaks are, are really bad. If you have them, you need to get rid of them. Uh, and perhaps, at least here in Utah, the biggest use of water for residential purposes is uh, actually lawns and gardens. Uh, so we have to be water wise in how we uh, plant our uh, landscaping on our houses to try and mitigate the amount of water that we need to keep them alive in the desert. So water pollution is referring to physical or chemical changes in the water that adversely affects the health of the humans or other organisms that rely upon that water. Unfortunately, water pollution is a global problem. Um, it extends from uh, urbanized areas all the way out uh, to the ocean um, from the, the flow of water that we have. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's a really difficult problem to deal with uh, once the pollution is in the water. So typically what happens is they try and find the sources of the pollution, cut those off, and then hope that Mother Nature uh, will restore the, the water to its original water quality over time by dilution or sedimentation. So another potential problem with water bodies is called eutrophication, 
and it's really a buildup of nutrients in a body of water. Uh, so over the pictures on the right, uh, on the right we have a crystal clear blue lake. This is Crater Lake in the Crater Lake National Park. And then down below we actually have a lake that is completely covered in green algae. Uh, the lake at the bottom is the one that has been gone through eutrophication. Um, it can occur naturally uh, into a lot of water bodies, but that occurs very slowly. Uh, but humans can cause imbalances. Um, they can pulse nutrients uh, and fertilizers into these water bodies that can uh, create these algae blooms. Um, and these, um, you know, these nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, are essential for life in small quantities. But if you have too much of the fertilizer, uh, it results in excessive algae growth which can then uh, suck up and use the oxygen that is in the water, uh, causing a problem where there's no oxygen in the water and animals that uh, live in the water that depend upon that oxygen will then die. So our sources of water pollution, we have point sources, uh, which have a very specific spot where that uh, pollution is coming from. And we have non-point or area sources that enter over a large area. And the, the classic examples for that are runoff, you know, coming from agricultural farms or coming from, you know, urban areas like uh, lawns or parking lots. Uh, another type of non-point source of water pollution is atmospheric deposition, where you have particles or gases that are being deposited from the atmosphere to the ground surface or a water body. So when it comes to water pollution, we really need to figure out how to control it. And the number one way to do that is to uh, prevent the pollution from happening in the first place by identifying the sources uh, of potential pollution and dealing with ways to mitigate that. So the cheapest and the most efficient or the most effective way to reduce that pollution is to avoid releasing it in the first place. And so we can you know, design products that don't pollute uh, we can design industrial processes that don't pollute, uh, and we can find ways to conserve our soil and prevent soil erosion from fouling our waterways. Another way to do it is to ban the release of pollutants that are harmful to our waterways. And the uh, a third way that we can actually do this is through the economics of consumer demand. Uh, consumers can demand that uh, companies produce products that are uh, produced in environmentally friendly ways. Uh, and that is one way that uh, we can encourage companies to be environmentally friendly. So unfortunately, when resources become scarce, it can lead to conflict. And we have had lots of conflicts with regards to oil. Uh, and as the population increases as the amount of fresh water availability goes down. Water is one of those commodities that could be a source of global conflict uh, moving forward. And many countries in the Middle East um, have very high populations, uh, very high uh, growth rates. Uh, many of these countries actually face significant water sources, shortages due to the uh, overdrafts of the groundwater. Uh, now, theoretically, they could turn to desalinization, but they have not done that yet. And I'm hoping that uh, solutions such as desalinization might be preferential over water wars uh, to secure resources. So most of the water in the dry regions of the, the Middle East come from the Nile, the Jordan, and the uh, Tigris rivers. And... Uh, Countries are in disagreement over who has the water rights for these. And currently, there are no cooperative agreements for use of 158 of the world's 263 water basins that are shared by two or more countries. 